Dolls play a prominent part in the life of Toy and Saraki. Of course, they help to provide a reminder of happy days, but they also seem to serve a secondary purpose. As she relaxes in her sitting room, she is surrounded by photographs of the people who are most important to her. If she can't physically be with them, she can, at least, spend time looking at them. When I visited her home, she showed me some booklets and pictures that were most significant to her. This is the personal health record. Basically, um, we discovered that in Nigeria, it's been very, very difficult for us to ensure and continuum of care, you know, from when a woman gets pregnant to when she has the baby to explain, you know, the different outcomes and also to be able to be sure that the child is having the best possible care to ensure survival. I looked at a few countries all over the world that have very, very good survival rates and I realized that they all have one thing in common. They're all using home-based, which is patient custody, health records. I worked very closely here with the Perinatal Institute I had a look at um, the health records that were being developed already in England and in use in England. I looked at the Japanese model, the Indonesian model, the Malaysian model. Then I went back home and I did a very long series of consultations with stakeholders all over the country. I think I must have spoken to two or three thousand doctors and people to see what they wanted in health records. And I was working in conjunction with the Federal Ministry of Health. and. Um, we came up with this, so this is being adopted now. Um, I think at the moment it's in seven states in Nigeria, and from the end of the year it should be in every state. And so basically every single pregnant woman from the first visit will get one of these, and we'll be able to track everything about her. It also gives us a lot of demographic data as well, you know, so what sort of home does she live in, does she have access to clean water, does she use a mosquito net, insecticidal treated net when she's sleeping at night. And we're hoping it will help us achieve the MDGs in the shortest possible time. What's the feedback that you've got from, from these So far, records? the feedback's been pretty good. I think we've got about 290,000 copies in circulation at the moment. And um, I'm not in charge of monitoring and evaluation. It's always good to have checks and balances. So even though the Wellbeing Foundation developed this in conjunction with the Federal Ministry of Health, it's their program. And they're running it, I believe, through the Primary Health Care Development Agency. And our numbers are dropping. Our mortality numbers are dropping. But really, I won't relax until every single pregnant woman in Nigeria has one of these and knows exactly what's supposed to be happening to her when she's pregnant. So much of it is knowledge and education, you know. If you're well educated about what you should expect, when you see something unexpected, you're in a better position to get help when you need it. So this little book is quite symbolic to you? Oh, it is, absolutely. Yeah. This little book, I think, is our passport to health, it's our passport to life, it's our passport to survival, and it's our passport to having the potential to grab the opportunities that are out there. We need to be alive to do that. We can't just be burying our sisters every day and you know, burying little children. You know, people look at it as a number, but what you have to realize that every time a family loses a mother, that family loses its potential for progress. And um, we've got to keep our women alive. We have to invest in women, actually. You know, it's a pretty low-cost resource, but I think it will have high impact. You're a first lady, but I guess you are a mother first oh, and absolutely. foremost. Absolutely. I, I've always um, felt that the most important duty is at home. I do think it's important as well for women to work, because I think for, for a mother to be fulfilled, and to be a happy woman, in which case her family becomes happier. You need to be educated, you need to be happy, you need to have some gainful income. And you need to also keep learning as you go along the way. So even with my children, you know, I'm always learning, learning. I, I take their textbooks and I read them in the middle of the night. Because even some of the things that these children are learning in school now are so different from the way we learned it. I, I thank God that I'm alive and I can be there for them. So even if it means losing sleep or flying through the night or a four or five hour journey, so long as I'm healthy and I can do it, I try to do it. And then when I'm not there, I try to build a strong structure around them. So family is very, very important to me. You know, I'm very close to my brothers, my sisters-in-law, and they all help out a lot as well. You know, if I can't make it to something, I can call one of them and they will, you know, dash across and be 
there for them. And it's, um, they've been wonderful, actually, in the last eight years. Do you think it is quite hard for you to, to strike that balance with work and motherhood? Um, I'm realistic. I'm not really trying to strike a balance. You know, I have this terrible, what I call my event track, my itinerary, which is in about five different colors, and it has everything and where everybody's supposed to be and what everybody's supposed to do, and I'm updating it constantly. I don't know. You would have to ask my children <laughs> if you could meet them or the people that know them, whether I've struck a balance, but I think that they know that I'm there for them, and even not just my children, my, my friend's children, my brother's children. I know they laugh about me behind my back, and they call me the area mother, you know, because, like, when it's an exit, my house is just full of kids. And I don't have too many rules, but my rules are quite rigid. And so you can tell, like, if they think I'm in a bad mood, they come in and they whisper, is she firing missiles today? <laughs> you know, but other than that, they're, I think they're happy. This is um, an 18th birthday party for my first daughter, actually. It was a happy time. It was time to rediscover, to remember from when the children were very little, see how they've grown. This is me and my daughter. And it's amazing to think you have them and they're so tiny. And then one day they're all grown up and they're going off to university and they're doing their own thing. It gives a lot of joy. We're grateful. So many people, their children don't, you know, make it to maturity because of poverty or because of lack of knowledge or sometimes just because of fate. And sometimes you just don't get the help in time and you lose people, but then you just have to try to remember the good bits and try to remember what they stood for. And they live on in our hearts and in the hearts of the people they loved and the people that love them. Coming up, Saraki outlines some of her plans for the future. I'm now putting together a think tank, which is going to be called the Think Africa Foundation. We already have one arm of it running, which is Think Africa Press Limited, and it's a platform for discourse where we have academics, writers, journalists, photographers, anybody who wants to share their knowledge about Africa. <laughs> <laughs>